And I never would have learned it back then. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I wasn't ready to learn it. Picture a campfire with a group of your friends sitting around it and everybody has a story to tell. Now, let's bring your friends inside, leave the campfire outside, and listen to their stories. The ninth thing that you guys should know about me is I don't believe in coincidence. I believe things happen for a reason and they happen when they should happen. I believe that Wayne wanted to have one last glass of wine with his sister and thank her for all of the great stuff she had done. Um, these little white papers that were sitting on, the sta uh, on your chairs, a lot of people who are here for the very first time may not know what these are all about. Uh, they ask for the first line of your story about water. Uh, if you are actually telling a story tonight, maybe you have a uh, different story about water. But what these are is to uh, help the evening flow along and uh, in between the actual storytellers, I will read a couple of these to uh, progress the evening along a little bit and uh, get that little sense of community going here. These are completely anonymous. You do not need to put a name on these. Uh, also, it's not the whole story, okay? Just a line or two would be great, uh, but it will definitely help the evening move along. So uh, if you have any of those floating around out there or if you need one or two of them, they are over here, I believe, and uh, there are some pens there. So feel free to do that and uh, you will be a part of the show as well. So thank you. And uh, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. And I wanted to say something about me up here interpreting. The real deal is, is uh, it's, uh, I'm do it's not a pleasurable experience for me to get up here and be a part of the act, so I'm not doing it for that. I I'm just making it available for the deaf community, so maybe some deaf people might come down here and tell their stories. Or maybe some kid will see it on TV and become an interpreter. Or maybe you'll take a sign language class and meet a deaf person. So the important thing is, is that you don't interact with me because that, uh, that adulterates the experience for the deaf person. So I, I'm not interested in uh, interacting with anyone because I didn't come to do that. And I think it really adulterates the experience, experience. Also, it takes away the attention from the person telling the story. And I know if you're not used to interpreters, it's easy to look at the interpreter and everything. But if you, you know, really, it, it's kind of disrespectful to the person telling the story and, and they're trying to engage you. So hopefully you see interpreters so much that you just don't look at us. But this would be in a, a circumstance in which we would ask you not to interact with the interpreter. So it's a clean experience for the deaf person and also so that the person up here feels respected too. You know, so you give them their attention. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Hey, welcome aboard. Let's, uh, how about let's start the night with a round of applause. And believe it or not, what he just said, I was gonna come up and say, but now I don't have to. So there you go. Uh, how about that? Uh, my name's Dave Picorni. I am the uh, host of your uh, lovely evening here this evening. Uh, and let me tell you about uh, West Side Stories. If you have not been here, and I know I do see some familiar faces, so bear with me if you have heard this before. Uh, this, we are trying to do a version of what they do in New York, Chicago, Detroit, and LA. This is uh, somewhat called a story slam is what it is. These are five minute true stories told live on stage without notes. Uh, and the, the key here is that they are stories. They are not uh, political rants, they are not comedy routines, they are not uh, any sort of uh, therapy session. <laughs> they are stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end, an arc to it, and they are at five minutes long. Um, to be eligible to win the lovely prize this evening, and every time we do this here, we have a $50 prize for the winner, and some audience member will choose who that story, Basically, they will choose the story they enjoyed the most. It doesn't mean it was the best story of the night or whatever it was. Uh, one person, that's what the little green tickets were at the end of the evening, will pull out one of those green tickets and the person that holds the uh, counterpart to that ticket will decide basically what story they enjoyed the most and that person will win $50 for the evening. Um, in order to be eligible for that $50, you must stay within the five minute time frame. So at five minutes, you will hear me ring a bell right over there. That means you have 
59 seconds to wrap it up to stay within five uh, under six, basically, is what you have to do. So that's uh, pretty much the rules here. Uh, once again, stories, not uh, political rants or any of that good stuff right there. A um, couple other little things. Like I said before, if uh, you have the small slips of paper, uh, you can just pass them, say, to the end down here, and we'll get them over at the bar, and I'll use them uh, later before the evening is over. I have 10 storytellers will happen this evening. Uh, right here are the storytellers. If there are more than 10 that have uh, filled out these, only 10 get on. Uh, the last person or two who uh, may not get on would come up and tell the very first line of their story and probably fit it into another uh, week uh, that we do this. We are here the second Wednesday of every single month. This is, I believe, our ninth consecutive month right here. So first off, thank you to one of our sponsors, Pelican Art Gallery. How about a large round of applause for them? Second sponsor I'd like to thank, uh, not just Zach right there, but uh, Zach, first of all, for coming out and filming all of these for us. And Petaluma Community Access uh, Television, which films these, uh, Zach goes and edits them, and then they're played four times a week right here in Petaluma. So the people that are not here tonight will probably watch them and say, oh yeah, I enjoyed it too. How about we do this? Next time you guys call them and tell them to come see it live. That's what we need to do. Get them down here, not wait for it on TV. It is on four times a week, uh, the, the same show. We have uh, eight months of it out there. Uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays it's played, 10 a.m. and 8 8 p.m., 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. So we're prime time is what we are right there here in lovely Petaluma. Um Couple other announcements about what's going on right here at the gallery, which is really important. I do have one more new sponsor that has added on. Not only do we have uh, Petaluma Community Access TV, Pelican Art Gallery, but the lovely bookmarks that are laying around. Uh, Electric Crayon Printing has uh, very graciously donated their services to put those together. Uh, they didn't put their logo on the back, but they will next time, they tell me. So it's Electric Crayon, and uh, they are uh, a new sponsor for us. So how about a nice round of applause for those guys just for helping us out as well. And those bookmarks right there, uh, if you see them laying around, those have the themes for all the, the, the months the rest of this year. So you can plan your stories for the rest of the year right there. The dates and the themes are right on there. And uh, you can grab one of those right here. Uh, you see me on the street. I probably have a dozen of them in my pocket. I will make sure that you uh, get one or two of them. Uh, a couple things that are going on right here at Pelican. Tomorrow, Facebook for business right here. Uh, Ruhi will be doing a uh, workshop and uh, I know her, she's very, very good. Uh, if you have a business and you wanna use social media, uh, Ruhi will come a, uh, right down here tomorrow night starting at uh, 6.30 to eight. And it's gonna be right in this very building and she's gonna put on a presentation for you to help get you uh, moving social media wise. Uh, Facebook for business tomorrow night right here. And the gallery has these lovely paintings and what they're calling the, the masters of today is uh, portraiture. I think I'm saying that right, am I? Portraiture is what it is right here. Uh, a lot of local artists uh, are, are on the walls in here. Uh, feel free to see those, uh, take a look around, purchase seven or eight of them. Uh, that would be a great idea. Uh, also, uh, this uh, exhibit will be going on here for a couple of months uh, right here at the gallery. So uh, come on down, bring your friends. Uh, what the heck, bring your enemies, who cares? Just bring people, that's what's really important. There you go. Uh, and then, like I said before, I will choose a storyteller. Those of you that have been through this before know that uh, I choose the storyteller. They don't know when they're gonna come up, uh, but in between, so that they have a little breather to go, oh my God, he just called my name. Uh, they get to uh, hear a couple of those little small story, uh, first line stories, uh, and that's what I use those for. So tonight's theme is water. We do a different theme every time. Um, I actually made my living as a stand-up comic for 10 years, and I got off the road uh, when my oldest daughter over there, who just got her permit the other day, so just so you guys know, yeah, we're very proud. Um, and uh, when she was born, I got off the road. I, I was on the road for 30 weeks the year before that uh, she was born uh, all over the country, and I no longer wanted to be on the road. And uh, part of what I wanted to do was you know, be a family. And what we do as a family is uh, a lot of different things. One of the things I, I really am not a big fan of is camping. I don't camp, okay? I don't actually even understand camping. Uh, to me, I figure as a, as a people, we have evolved. <laughs> we used to live outdoors. Cavemen invented fire. They looked for shelter. They moved indoors. We had built log cabins, indoor plumbing, electricity, microwaves, 
heating. And then for vacation, people go sleep outside with wild animals and pee behind rocks. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. My feeling for vacation is, if somebody's not cleaning my room for me and putting a mint on my pillow, I'm not freaking going. That's all there is to it right there. But yet, my kids can talk me into almost anything. And so I compromised. And a couple years ago, uh, we decided to take a, a one-day canoe trip uh, up on the Russian River. And what I did is I called one of the companies locally and I asked them about it. And, and they said, oh, it's just, you're just drifting down the river. It's really simple, really easy. And I said, really? Because I, I have an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old and myself and my wife, and I, I don't really swim that well. Um, is this something that we should be doing? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just drifting down the river. You're just going to be drifting down the river. It's really easy. In fact, the river will take you most of the way. It's really easy. And I'm like, okay, really, that sounds pretty good. And they said, well, we have a, a three-hour trip and we have a five-hour trip. And I said, well, you know, I've never really done this before. Uh, and again, I'll rem remind you, I have an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old and never have we done anything like, no, 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 it's totally fine. You'll just be drifting down the river. Okay. I said, okay, great. Which one do you recommend? You, the the three-hour or the five-hour? They go, you know what? If I was you, I'd take the five-hour. You get yourself a lunch. You pull over anywhere along the river and you, and you have a nice little uh, box lunch out there. It's like, okay, that sounds like a great day. So we get in the car and we get up to Healdsburg up there and uh, we get in a bus and we, they take us up to the, the drop-off point. And, uh, and, and again, I explain, you know, we've never done this before. Somebody's gonna explain what we're supposed to do. Oh yeah, yeah, there, there's a guy up there that puts the boat in the water for you and he'll, he'll explain everything that happens. So when we get up there, what I really want what I really need to see is some like grizzled old river man is what I want to see. And what I get is some like 17 year old skateboarder dude who looks at us and said, dude, there's your boat. I'm like, no, 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 you, you didn't actually understand. We've never done this before. Somebody said you would explain. Oh, all right, dude, I got it. So you guys want one boat or two? I said, wow, again, we've never done this before, I think we should probably all stay together. That would be a good idea. He says, all right, dude, we'll get you in one boat. He said, person in the front is going to just paddle and side and side, and person in back does the steering. You want to go this way, you paddle on that side. You want to go that way, you paddle on that side. All right, dude, later. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's it? That's all we have to do? He's like, yeah, that's it. Oh, maybe I should tell you about, there's a couple of spots on the river that you should know about. It's a spot about 15 minutes down where the water is a little too shallow and you're gonna to have to get out and drag your boat over the thing. And I'm like, all right, that's, that's not too bad, that's fine. Because then a little bit further down, there's a spot where a tree is just blocking the river. And again, you're gonna to have to get out and drag your, your boat over this little peninsula thing. It's like 10, 15 feet or so. Okay, and he goes after that, Smooth sailing. See you, dude. And he goes back off to his bong or whatever the hell else he was doing. I have no idea. And, and we get into this canoe and we shove off. And, you know, we're cruising right along. We're just drifting down the river. And we get to the spot where the, the water is too shallow. And I, I'm a total idiot. As I'm getting out of the boat, I capsize the thing. And, you know, all of our beach towels and our, our phones, which we kept in plastic bags, thank God. But uh, everything is completely doused at this point, which adds, I don't know, about another 60 pounds to the canoe because these towels that were wringing out are now completely sopping wet. We managed to drag the boat across the little shallow area. And we're going down a little bit further. And we, we come to the part where, okay, well, there's the tree. We're going to have to pull it over this peninsula that was like an island, for God's sake. It was just this 20-foot little area. And my wife and I are now trying to drag this 300-pound canoe across. And thank God, another couple pulled up at the same time. And they helped us, and we helped them get over. And then it's smooth. We're just drifting down the river. And so we come to this one bend. And as we start to go around this one bend, we start getting pulled towards the left. And, and I remember that if you want to go that way, you start paddling on this side. And we are paddling harder and harder and getting sucked faster and, fa and paddling harder than I ever freaking paddled in my life. And we can't stop the boat from slamming into this tree. And again, I'm a total idiot. I don't know what I've done, but I capsized the boat again. And I'm in the water. And like I said before, 
I'm not the best swimmer on the planet. I can hold my breath. That's what I can do. Swimming, not my, you know, forte. But I'm in the water, and Juliet and the two girls are in the boat. Now, she manages to grab the older of the daughter and throw her up against the tree and pin her with her arm, while Alexis now screams because Miranda is going down with the boat, okay? Juliet looks over, and she's like freaking Wonder Woman, for God's sake. She reaches down, grabs her by the back of the life vest, pulls her up, throws her between her legs, flips her legs up onto the tree, and has now got this one pinned here, the other one in between her legs, and has saved both of their lives. I, on the other hand, am grasping for anything. I, I look like Pee Wee Herman flailing, being chased by a pit bull, for God's sake. I am just trying to grasp on to anything, and I, I think I grabbed the last leaf that I can possibly grab, and I managed to pull myself up the, the tree, and I climb all the way back up, and she hands me uh, Miranda and Alexis, and then we get her up there, and, and we get off of the tree. And just as we're you know, gathering ourselves, we look, and here comes another family around this bend, paddling as fast as they possibly can paddle, and slam right into the same tree, and they capsize, and their son is now going under. They manage to get him out, and they're up on the tree, and now a third canoe comes around, and I am not making this up, slams into it and goes down, and now they're all looking down, and they can see our canoe, which is way down underneath there, and they go, there's another canoe down there. There's the Picorni family behind the tree waving at them over there. And they said, well, what happened? And we told them the whole story. And now they've set up a chain down the river so that we can get to the other side of the river. A couple of us climb and, you know, we throw our kids across the river and they stop them from drifting down. And literally our, our paddles are gone, our uh, box lunches, everything is freaking gone down the river. And we managed to loosen our canoe out of this thing. And now we have to get back in the canoe and go the rest of the way. This is a five hour trip. And my kids are completely terrified and said, no, let's not do it. Well, how the hell are we gonna get out of here? We've got to go in the boat. Now, every time there's any sort of rushing water, they are literally screaming and inside I am too, but you know, I'm the dad, I can't let them know that. And um, we managed to finally, I probably took us, you know, six, seven hours maybe to get down there. We finally get down to the bottom where they're, they're picking everybody up. We get in the, uh, the uh, um, bus to go back to the place and the other two families are there and we're all just completely traumatized. And when we get back to the place, the River's Edge, which is the name of the company, by the way, uh, we get back there and uh, the woman says, well, how was your day on the river? And my wife just unloads on them. What are you people, insane? Throwing us out there, we all almost died. And she just really goes off on this woman. And finally at the end, the woman says, wow, I, I feel really bad. Can I offer you another free day on the river? <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. So uh, needless to say, we have not been back to the Russian River for canoeing. So that's my water story for you guys right there. Thank you. There you go. So I am now going to pull a name uh, of our first storyteller for the evening. Uh, this will be, let's see, I'm just going to reach in the middle here. Pull out this one and see who it is. Bill Cohill is our first uh, storyteller for the day, right here. I'm gonna put that, I'll fold it that way so I know I don't pull him twice. And then while Bill is mentally preparing himself, I will randomly pull out one of these. Please share the first line of your story about water. In high school and part of college, I was a lifeguard. Okay, well that's it, there you go. <laughs> I'm sure the story gets better as it goes along, but that first line right there, not exactly a grabber. Um, there you go. Bill, are you ready? ready? Ladies and gentlemen, please a huge round of applause for Bill Cohill. I think it's important for teenagers to always stay in school and never to drop out. I did, however, take the five-month sabbatical. 
What I did was I wanted to go on adventures on the high seas. So I started my adventure on a cruise ship to the Caribbean, and I worked on deck as a deckhand. And now there was 26 different nationalities on board ship. And the officers were all European, and the deckhands were all Jamaican. And I was the token white boy. What ended up happening after I worked for a few days, people came up to me and said, I can't believe you're still here. There's been never a white man that's ever survived working with the Jamaican crew. And I, I really liked the Jamaicans, and I, I was wondering, you know, why did I work out and nobody else ever did? And I think I just gave them an ounce of respect, and they returned that with a ton of appreciation. I expressed a little interest in their culture, and they really appreciated that too. But in this black and white world that I was living in, they couldn't accept me as a white person, so what they told me was, you're not white, you're black, you're one of us. And so many of them told me that, I was actually convinced I was black. <laughs> but I still had a lot of problems with getting sunburned. Now, my next uh, adventure was working in New Orleans. I joined the Merchant Marines, and I worked on tugboats. And a hurricane hit, and an uh, oil rig broke loose and was drifting around in the Gulf of Mexico. The, the storm was so bad that the Coast Guard said, we're not going out there to find these guys that are drifting around on the oil rig. We're going to wait till the storm is going to clear. That was probably a good idea. But our company was hired to do this, and our captain fearlessly went out, and I got a real taste of what it's like to be on the rough seas. And it was quite the adventure. We found the oil rig. We towed them back to where they uh, were moored. And that was an exciting adventure. Then I went back to high school, graduated with my class, then after that, I went on to college. But halfway through college, I had to take a break because I had to go back out to sea. And what I did was I studied semester at sea. It's a program where you study on board ship. And then what you do is you go visit the place. And you do that all the way around the globe. Now, fortunately for me, a lot of the countries we went to were developing countries, and I think it's a lot more fascinating to see them because they're so different than our own country. And let's see. One of the things I ended up quickly getting bored with is going to the same tourist sites that everybody else was going on. So in order to find the most interesting people, what I would do is intentionally get lost. And what I would do is I'd jump on a bus and not know where it was going. I would hitchhike, and I would meet people that way. I'd meet people on the buses. I'd meet people wherever I was going. I'd uh, hike. I even, on occasion, jumped on the back of an ox cart just to see where it was going. And I got to some pretty remote villages. And what I found is if you show the people just a little bit of respect and show a little bit of interest in their culture, They'll open up their homes and their hearts to you. So if you're ready for a big adventure, just add water. <laughs> Bill Cohill, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Have a big hand for Bill. Our first story teller of the evening. Uh, I'm going to pull a name from, um, not the hat, the basket. If I had a really cool hat, that would be great. That hat would work right there. This one right here is what I'm gonna go with. This is Leslie Scatchard is gonna be our second storyteller of the evening right there. Uh, again, we'll slow down. How do you sign applause? All right, just kidding. Here we go, a couple of these. My mother never learned to swim. There you go. I'm sure that would have been excellent. I hope you're telling your story this okay. evening. And uh, please share the first line of your story about water. Cobalt. 
That's it. I have no idea what that exactly means, but I had to make sure that I read that one because uh, it just interested the heck out of me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage, Leslie Scatcher. Here she is. I had a thrilling experience in the water. I took a Spanish class down in Baja, California, in a little fishing village called Bahia de Los Angeles um, on the Sea of Cortez side. And it was about eight hours from the nearest city, which was Ensenada. So it was really remote. And I had never been in a place that, had, that was so far from anything. It was a great place, though, because we got to take Spanish classes all morning. And then we had this marine biologist who was living at the station there with us. And he would take us out on the boats every afternoon. And he taught us about everything, all the marine life that was out there. We would go out and chase whales around. And at night, sometimes we'd go out and swim with the dolphins in the bioluminescent water. And we'd look like Tinkerbell with all the sparkling. It was amazing. So, one day, we were going to go to the island where the sea lions lived. And he sat us all down and talked to us about sea lions. And he told us they were basically gentle creatures, but that you wanted to respect them and not to threaten them in any way. And they would be very cool. He said, you know, leave about 20 feet between you and the sea lion, and everything will be fine. OK, so we got on the boats, and we went out. And he stopped the boat pretty far off the island, and he said, now just slither into the water, don't make a big splash, and then you know swim toward the island. So we did that. We all have our snorkels and mask and fins, and I get off the boat and I'm swimming, and right away, swimming along, and here comes a sea lion right underneath me, just five feet under me, and it's swimming like this, <laughs> right? I'm like this, and it's like this, just swimming along. And I, you know, I threw my snorkel. I'm going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. You know, and it's just right there and checking me out. It was thrilling. So I swim a little further, and there's this woman who's in the class. And she had brought her eight-year-old daughter down also. So the two of them are just hanging in the water, obviously looking at something under the water. So I swim over, and I look. And there is a mother and pup sea lion just six feet from her, from them, just hanging in the water, just staring back. And so there they are in this, you know. So I joined the party, and I'm just hanging there with them. And we were there probably 10 minutes just checking each other out. And it ran through my mind. I thought, we're a little close here. But they seem to be enjoying it as much as we do. So I didn't see how there could be any problem. So everything's great. 10 minutes, we're just. And then Chris shows up. And Chris is this big, strapping, young 18-year-old guy. He's in the class. He's like a football player type, you know, sweetheart. He comes up, and he sees what's going on. And oh, my gosh. So he just joins us, and he's swimming. We're, we're just mesmerized with these things. And within 30 seconds of Chris arriving, out of nowhere comes this huge bull sea lion, big sagittal crest on his forehead. It comes swooping in. It comes right up in front of Chris, right up in his face like this. And it goes, ah, right in Chris's face. And Chris is like, shoot, out of his snorkel. And he's back pedal, back pedal, back pedal, trying to get away from this thing swims back to the boat. I have been swimming with that kid for two weeks. I have never seen him move like that. And gets to the boat, usually has a hard time getting up. He popped out of the water like a cork and slams down on the deck of the boat. The three of us are just like, what just happened? The sea lions are gone. So we swim back to the boat. We get up. And as we're talking and kind of recovering, we decided that the male was fine as long as it was females looking at females. But as soon as this male came so close to this bull's family, that thing was 
pissed. And he wanted to make sure that Chris was gone. So we decided right then that we were going to listen to the marine biologist from that point on and do every single thing he said. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, give me going for Leslie. All right, let's go right in about that far, I think. Our next story for this evening is Colette McMullen. There she is. Uh, hang on, let's start. We will give her a chance to collect her thoughts right there while I read. Again, if there are any more of these, uh, feel free to uh, have them come down over here. Uh, next one says, please share the first line of your story about water for adventure. Just dive in and get wet. All right. And then, of course, there is cobalt. <laughs> no idea. Uh, Colette, are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, Colette McMullen. So my mother never learned to swim, and it was very important to her that all seven of her children learn to swim. And um, I took to it very easily because ever since, you know, I, I, I was little, I could, you know, whether it was mud puddles and then, you know, the, my parents used to take us to the beach a lot, so I was always in water, and I always loved it. So when I was about five years old, uh, we went to uh, a neighbor's who had a swimming pool and taught swimming lessons, and that was great. That was fun, you know, just a lot of the little waddling around the pool, uh, duck paddling and dog paddling and all that. And, um, but when I was six, uh, my mother took us to the big pool, and um, so the big pool uh, was actually at a, um, you know, it's like we have here in Petaluma, one of the, you know, the community pools, and uh, they actually had two pools. One was kind of a smaller pool for the kids just learning to swim, and then there was the more Olympic-sized pool, which actually had three diving boards. There were two kind of lower boards, and then there was a, the high board, the high board. And so, <laughs> so we uh, were doing great with our swimming lessons, and I just loved it. And um, uh, so then one day the teacher says, okay, well, come on over. We're going to go over to the big, you know, the, the Olympic pool, the big pool. And so I was all excited. Oh, great, the big pool. And so we go over there, and she uh, has us all sit on the bench and just watch her. So uh, she climbs up the ladder of the tall diving board and walks to the end of the board and then dives in. I thought, that was really cool. And uh, then she says, okay now class, who wants to try it? <laughs> and I was, of course, just, oh yeah, me, 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 I wanna go, I wanna go first, I wanna go first. So I, um, you know, walk over to the ladder, and I think this was my first experience of realizing that I had a fear of heights. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, go over to the ladder, and I'm just, you know, starting to, okay, just, you know, just go really slowly, one hand, one foot at a time, and oh, no, 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 don't look down, don't look down, just look straight ahead, just look straight ahead, keep, you know, keep my eyes on the ladder, so up I crawl slowly, you know, pull myself up on top of the board. And so there I am, I'm on this, what seemed like the skinniest platform I've ever seen in my life. And I had to walk what seemed forever to the end of the board. Okay, if I can just do that next step. So, okay, just stay focused on the board. Don't look down, don't look down. Okay, just stay focused on the board. And so I get out to the end of the board and I'm looking down at the water. I love the water. I can see the bottom of the pool that is so far down. Okay, 
just do what the teacher did, everything will be fine. She showed me how to do it, look really easy, I can do this. Okay, so I leap out and fall and then I ended up just getting the wind knocked out of me because I didn't dive far enough and it was like a, you know, belly flop. <laughs> Okay, whew, all right, well, I, I, I'm six years old, but I can still swim okay, so I make it to the end of the, the pool, climb up the little ladder, and I knew I must have done something wrong. Oh my God, I am so humiliated. Here, I was so excited about saying yes and just going for it and just, you know, I, I just felt just humiliated. So I go over and I just sit down on the bench and I'm just going to sit there and just um, hope that nobody notices or something. You know, I, I just, I'm sitting there. And the teacher comes over and says, okay, clap. That was really, really close. You were so brave to, to just take the chance and do this. And Okay, I, I just want you to, I want you to go again. I'm just sitting there going, I'm in pain, I don't wanna go. No, okay, you have to do it. You, 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 you're just very close, you've gotta get up and do it now. So here's what you do. You, you, all you have to do is just lean over a little bit further and, and point your hands like this and then just bend over a little bit more and just allow yourself to just flow into the water. Okay, 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 All right. So now back over to the ladder. Just look straight ahead, don't look down. Okay, back onto the platform, go to the end. Okay, I dive in. Yay, it was good, I loved it, it worked out. <laughs> Swim to the end, get out of the water. And this is just how I, I can remember, I remember very few things about when I was six years old, but this just stands out in my mind as something so exciting where I said, yes, yes, yes. And even though it felt like I failed, I got up, I did it again, and it worked out. And that's my story, thanks. Nice job. Colette, ladies and gentlemen, Colette McMullen. all while John does roadie work for me right there. Thanks, I appreciate that. Our next storyteller this evening is Bradford Rex. That is his name right there. Uh, pull that that way, so I'm gonna pull it again. And right off the bat, we have Cobalt. Uh, <laughs> oh, no idea what's going on there. Uh, please share the, oh, actually one other thing I wanted to tell you guys before we do that. Uh, I, I know some of you are total social media people and you're all over the Facebook thing. What you need to do is go to West Side Stories page, uh, hit the like button and uh, let's uh, make this place jam packed. When we went to the one in New York, there were 300 people there and they were down the, the street and New York ain't got crap on Petaluma. So you know what, there's absolutely no reason why people are at home watching, you know, The Voice or some stupid TV program, well, they can be out with you people, hanging out, listening about true life stories. So, hit the like button, tell your friends, let's get them down here. Also, there's that email list at the end of the evening, you can do that and pass out some of those bookmarks. And then, right before Brad comes up, we have, please share the first line of your story about water. I used to date a SEAL trainer from Marine World. <laughs> I hope that's not your story, Brad. All right, good, all right, okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Bradford Rex, here he is. When I was a child, I knew that the earth, three quarters of the earth surface was covered with water and that I was gonna be the next um, Jacques Cousteau. I was 50% right. 
we'll let that settle in. And <laughs> my parents were afraid that I was never going to learn to swim, but I did, and it ended up paying for college. And I avoided a real job for a long time by, by swimming and fell into the world of triathlons. And this is a long way to get to the point of I found myself in central Florida at a race, and it was a 2.4 mile swim and 112 mile bike ride and a, a 26 mile run. And it was a multi-loop course. And the best thing about this course was that we went past the Claremont Bar and Lounge over and over again. It was a turnaround point on the swim. We went past it twice on the bike. And we went past it four times on the run. And I got to know the people at the Claremont Bar and Lounge very well. And when I finished the race, I, uh, I went back to the bed and breakfast that the race directors had put me up in. And I was putting my bike into a case to be shipped back home. And I could see the finish line, and there wasn't a whole lot going on there. But I could look across the lake, and I could see the Claremont Bar and Lounge, and it seemed very busy. So I, um, I packed up a t-shirt, a couple of dollar bills, and some flip-flops, and put them in a plastic bag, and tied them around my waist, and swam across the lake, because I didn't feel like walking around the lake. And I'd already put my bike in a box. So I swam across the lake to the Claremont Bar and Lounge, and they were very happy to see me. They had watched me swim across the lake, and they'd been listening on the radio. The AM, local AM radio station, had been broadcasting the event, so all 37 people that lived in town had heard <laughs> of what had gone on. And I found out a couple of things. I really didn't need the flip-flops or the, the T-shirt, because if you've ever been to Central Florida, you really don't need shirt and shoes to get service. And because all 37 people that had listened to the radio broadcast were in the Claremont Bar and Lounge, and so they, they provided beer for me way into the wee hours. And then since none of the people there were in any shape to drive me back to the bed and breakfast where I needed to be that night, I swam back across the lake. Which, it sounds like a long way, but it only took a few minutes. And about midway across the lake, I realized that alligators lived there because it was, it was central Florida. So I, I swam very quietly and <laughs> made it back to the bed and breakfast. Now, I had to get up in the morning and go to the awards ceremony. And when I got out of bed at the bed and breakfast, there were a number of people in the, in the parking lot. And I was thinking it was all 37 people that had listened to the radio broadcast of the race the day before. And there were two sheriff's deputies and um, someone from Fish and Game, and a number of the ne'er-do-wells from the Claremont Bar and Lounge, because they were afraid that I'd not made it across the lake, and they had, they'd been searching for my body all night. <laughs> There's also a guy from the newspaper, and um, a number of the people were happy to see me that I was still alive, and some were disappointed, because it would have made a better story if I hadn't made it across <laughs> the lake. So, if you ever go to Florida, a lot of my stories have either a, um, a point, which there is none to this story, or some of them have a moral and there's no moral to this story, but if you ever go to Central Florida and you find yourself in Claremont, you really, it would behoove you to go to the, uh, the Claremont Bar and Lounge. I never did find the lounge part, just the bar. <laughs> Bradford Rex, ladies and gentlemen. Bradford Rex. I'm go with that one. See who that might be. That is Steve Dyer. Steve is our next storyteller. There he is. So that right there. This one here. I know you're expecting me to say something, but. <laughs> I remember being baptized and thinking, what a crock. But then I started dating a member of Billy Graham's Youth Crusade. Suddenly, doused in holy water took on a whole new meaning. Wow. That's a keeper right there. That's nice. Steve, are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, big hand for Steve Dyer. Here he is. So when my daughter turned 10, um, I thought this might be a good time for her to um, experience what we in the United States call a third world country or a developing country. 
We've done a lot of traveling across the United States. We've done a couple of road trips all the way across the United States. And I thought, well, it's time for to see something different. So um, I had done a lot of traveling in Central America and Mexico. And I thought, well, uh, Yucatan, the uh, Caribbean side of Yucatan, might be a good place to go. I understood a little bit. Thought it would be an interesting place. So we had to get there, and um, Haley finished school, and uh, it was June, just right after finishing school, and I looked for a cheap flight to Mexico. And the cheapest flight I could find was a plane thing called Sun Trips, and they actually flew to Cancun. So I thought, okay, that's fine. I'll, I can go to Cancun, and we'll take land land travel all the way down to where I planned to go. Um, what I didn't realize was that it was the end of the year and seniors, 17, 18, and 19 years old, all went to Cancun on the week after they got out of high school. So um, we got to the plane and it was all 17, 18, 19 year olds. And uh, the plane was full of them. So, and my daughter, Ken, and me. So we taxied out to the runway, and there started to be a commotion about two-thirds of the way back in the plane. And it turns out there was a boyfriend and a girlfriend there, and the girl decided that she wasn't quite sure what she wanted to go on this trip. So we got to the runway, and the plane stopped, and stewardesses walked back, and they continued to argue, have a, a really vehement argument. And um, that went on for like 20 minutes. <clears throat> well, eventually we taxied back, and they actually had to find her suitcase, which they did, which took another hour. So anyway, they, were, they departed, and we flew off, and we went to Cancun, and we got on a, you know, on a bus and traveled down to um, a little town just north of Tulum, the uh, ruins of Tulum on the Caribbean coast. And um, while we were there that afternoon, I thought, let's, let's go swimming. So we headed to the beach. It was a local beach, which was great because when we got to the beach, it was all Mexicans, all except for two gringos, my daughter and me. Now the beach was full, it was packed with people. It was only about 50 foot deep on the beach itself. And um, it's blankets scattered all over and a couple cabanas in the back, of the back of the beach. So we proceeded to jump into the water and we were out about 100 yards and uh, enough where I could stay with my head above water and watch my daughter, who was a good swimmer, but I still was keeping an eye on her. And I turned around and we were facing the beach. And I, I was just enjoying the whole moment. It was warm, the water was warm. It was great, we were on a beach with locals. It was something I really wanted her to experience. And that went on for a few minutes until I heard behind me, 50 yards out more, a person wailing, screaming at the top of his lungs. I turned to look and there was a little person and it was a shock at first when I looked at it. And I realized there was nobody around this little person, yet they were in deep water 50 yards past where I was. Um, and so I looked again and immediately swam out to the person, you know, I said, Haley, you wait here, you know, I swam out to him. I got up closer and this was a little boy. This was a boy of maybe three or four with no one around him wailing at the top of his lungs, and I kept thinking, how did he get out here? How did he get out here and still be alive? So I put him under my arms and swam back to the beach. As I got back to the beach, I kept speaking to him in Spanish, trying to maybe calm him down, but it never happened. He just kept wailing and wailing. So we got back on the beach. He was only about this high, little, and I turned him around and had him standing in front of me, looking at the beach, looking to see a family or a mother or a father or something looking at the beach, nothing changed. No one reacted. He was still wailing at the top of his lungs. Nothing. 
looked both ways. Nothing happened. My daughter's standing looking at me. From behind a cabana come a family moving in unison, about five of them, come down to wander down to the beach, get to him, take him out of my hands, lay him down on his stomach, and begin furiously pumping his legs back over to his butt while he's laying on his face. Just furiously as if we were a pump. We're both looking at this whole thing going on, and about three minutes go by, and they pick him up, and they go the same way. They kind of do all in unison back behind the cabana. Nothing has had changed on the beach. Nobody's moving, nobody's looking at us. And I'm looking at my daughter and saying, welcome to Mexico. <laughs> One more time for Steve Dyer, ladies and gentlemen. Steve. I'm going to shuffle these up just a little. See where we are. Okay. I'm pull this name out. Cobalt. Oh. <laughs> Stay with me, everybody, all right? Come on. Susan Seats. Am I saying it right? Nope. Seitz? Oh, I was so close. Second time. All right, hang on right there, Susan. I just want to um, show you guys the bookmarks that uh, Electric Crayon did for us. They did a very nice job. And uh, not only do they do a nice job, these have all the themes for the upcoming months uh, all the way through the end of December, or through December. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, tonight, water. Then we have high school. So stories about high school. Easy money will be a theme in September, October, Halloween-ish, we're gonna go with I'm so scared. And then November will be the one that got away. And then in December, a snowball's chance. So uh, grab these, grab your, uh, so you know what your story is going to be coming up. And uh, are you ready, Susan? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna big round of applause for Susan Seitz. Did I get it right that time? Cobalt, the color, the color that I saw went going through the Homer Tunnel down in Milford Sound, the south part of the South Island of New Zealand, cobalt everywhere. It was an area where glaciers had crawled across the land two million years ago. It was a fjord of cobalt water, deep, dark, inviting cobalt. We went out into the harbor or into the water area and stayed the night. I found that that was the best way to see this cobalt up close and personal. Everybody went to bed at night I climbed out on top and listened. It was black. The sky was black. Up above was the Milky Way. It looked like dandelion fluff. And I heard <laughs> something was coming in and out of the water like someone sewing rhinestones into black taffeta. But it was fish or fur seals or something. And in the morning, as the sun was melting over the cliffs, the skippers asked if I wanted to go out in a kayak. Well, sure. So I went out with somebody else. I had my kayak. Someone else had a kayak. But he was intimidated by the deep, dark cobalt. And I could paddle by myself in Milford Sound. As I put my paddle into the water, I stirred up visions of gold and silver, jewels. The sun continued to melt and pour down the cliffs and I was stirring up 
gold and silver. Until the skipper called to me and said, so over there was a fur seal. The fur seal was lying on its back, flipping, flipping his fish back and forth to kill it. And I paddled slowly to the fur seal until I was about five feet away and I just watched and he flipped and flipped this fish back and forth and then he submerged and he came up and looked at me and I looked at him and there we were in the middle of the cobalt with one dead fish, <laughs> one living woman kayaking and the skipper called me and I kayaked, I paddled back to the boat. I just felt invigorated, alive. It was dynamic to be surrounded with cobalt. One more time for Susan, ladies and gentlemen. Susan Seats, Seitz. Uh, this would be Mark Cowtree. Courtney, that's what I said. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mark, are you ready? All right, uh, I'm just gonna bring him straight up then. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen, how about a huge round of applause? First timer here, Mark, come on down. Welcome aboard, Mark, come on up. Hello, my name is Mark. Everybody say hi, Mark. Mark. Hi, Mark. Uh, my name is spelt with a C. Say Mark with a C. Mark. Show me your C. Yeah. Uh, I am a gymnastics and dance teacher. I'm used to a very interactive audience. Um, the idea of speaking about water was very uh, interesting to me. Can you step back a bit farther, please? Um, because water, the ideas, the, the images of water that came up to me uh, were very polarized. It was very, either very terrorizing or very comforting. And so I'll start, you know, with the, the terrorizing things. The first was uh, we were in Germany and um, we were at a big public pool and people were undressing in public and that was very strange and very upsetting for me. But I got used to that quickly, but it was a wave pool and I was a good swimmer, but uh, the wave thing was very un unusual for me. I didn't like it. And my dad, the master sergeant, wanted me to feel comfortable in the wave pool and held me in it and I cried. It was horrible, it was terrible. Uh, that was yucky. Um, then as a young, maybe 13 year old in Louisiana, maybe 12, uh, we lived near the, in Baton Rouge, uh, near the Mississippi River Bridge, and you could walk underneath um, an old uh, pier, and you could walk, and the Mississippi River would be underneath you. And I remember walking on the, the, the pylons or whatever, the supports, and looking and seeing a snake in the water, and thinking, oh my God, I could like fall in the water and die, but I didn't, but the next week, we were walking, and uh, my cousin had her dog, Fifi, or Poo Poo, or whatever her name was, and, and she wanted the dog to go with us, and I was holding the dog, and I gave her the dog, and I fell, and fortunately, the water was, you know, it was low tide, and I fell in the mud. I got stuck in the mud. Everybody had to jump in the mud and pull me out, and so that was not a fun water experience. And then about a year after that, we were um, canoeing. Uh, you would park your car up here, and your uncle would park his car there, and you'd all drift down and then go back up. And uh, I was, uh, you know, in the, you know, I was going along, and, you know, my uncles had their, you know, their beer and their, you know, inner tube, and we're all, like, having fun. And suddenly I felt my foot, oh, and it was a sharp pain. And you may not remember this, I don't know. It was like just a sharp pain. It's like, oh, my God, a snake has gotten me. 
Well, it wasn't, it was a catfish line, and the catfish line had hooked me, and they all had to stop, and everybody came together to pull me up, and they realized they unhooked me, and so, although, you know, in reflection, it was great, because everybody came to save me, it was terrifying, and so there we are, and then so, um, then jumping forward quite a few years, many, many years, I was in Sydney, Australia, and, um, I was at uh, Tamarama Beach. No, I was, a, I was at Bondi Beach. And I was, had my fins on and I was um, body surfing and having a great time and uh, seeing someone out in the distance flailing and yelling and, and, and realizing he was drowning. And I realized I was the only person close that could save him. And, you know, Australia is known for its Asian community that sometimes doesn't know the swimming and the, 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 the surfs. And so I, I realized I could save him, and I did, and I got to him. And he was frantic, and he was like this. And he clutched me, and I had never had any experience. And he clutched me, and I was going down because he was hovering me. And I pushed him away from me and pulled him and instinctively pushed him around from me. And Finally, I, was, I said, you're okay, you're okay. And the Australian surf guy came out, and he was very boy. All right, mate, put him up here. He's all right, he's all right. And I was, I was struck, and I saw him later in the sand with his friends. And maybe he didn't know me, but I knew him. And two weeks after that, we were, I was with some friends up in northern, north of Sydney. And, and they were all said, Mark, be careful, the, 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 the rift tides, be careful. And I was like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm a good swimmer. Well, sure enough, I got out into the water and I was swimming and I was having fun, but suddenly my friends were way over there and I was way over here and I was swimming and they were hollering, Mark, Mark. And I realized, oh my God, I and I felt that same fear, and I was like, oh my fucking God, I could die. And I had with that same fury that I saved the man, I saved myself, and so that's the crescendo of the fear, terror, my water experience. And so ah, with that, I'll tell you about some of the, the other end of the spectrum, which is me, um, okay, I'll go quick, me um, being in the water and realizing that I could go, uh, uh, in the swimming pool uh, and make everything click, 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 click down. Me being in the water and being in Bali and, and feeling the warm water in the, in the, from the waterfall falling on my shoulders. Me being in the water and realizing as a dancer that I could do things in the water that I couldn't do any fucking where else. <laughs> Woo, how fun is that? Me being in the water and realizing one day that I was part of the water, that the water was in me and I was part of the water. And me, a couple of years ago at Kavanaugh Pool right here in Petaluma, I was new to Petaluma and I was walking along and I found there's a pool in my neighborhood and a woman when I came was walking by and she said, feel free to join us as I was looking at the sign saying aqua therapy because I was worried aqua therapy, I shouldn't be here but she walked by, she said, come, feel free to join us and I did that day and so now I go all the time to the Petaluma pool and, and it makes me feel part of the community and I want to appreciate all of the community experience of being with you all today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a big hand for Mark right there? All right, let's see what we got here. I'm going to go with the one right in the middle. Bang. That is Katie Redman. There you are. All right. Um, before we bring Katie up, this one right here I know all too well. I was two weeks late delivering my first child and the doctor said it was going to be big. <laughs> there she is, right there. Uh, hard to believe that uh, that child right there was 10.02 ounces right there. Yeah, she was, uh, I, we haven't fed her since, so she's now only about 12 pounds, so that's good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage, Katie. Redmond, right here. Okay, I'm relatively new to microphones, so raise your hand if you can't hear me. You can, thank you. 
I'm the person who was a lifeguard in high school and part of college, and so I'm listening to everyone's stories and my heart's fluttering because, well, I started out on a swim team, so I swam my whole life. And frankly, for a while there, I was buff. <laughs> I mean, I could swim miles. I was good. And I got to be a lifeguard and a swim instructor, and it was so fun. I loved the fact that Redding had a 50-meter pool right off the Sacramento River. And I was one of the people who was tan <laughs> and walked up and down and had little kids look at me as I walked by. Wow, the lifeguard. I was so cool. I loved getting up on the tower, being able to go, walk, <laughs> and watch people go, and being able to turn to people and blow my whistle, you, get in the shallow end, you haven't passed the deep water test. It's a little tricky with adults. Usually you'd let them slide unless you could see someone really, really couldn't swim and then you get down and go over and say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, we need everyone here to pass a deep water test. Could you possibly go to the shallow end? That was a little tricky, but it got to be where we had our regulars and the part they liked the most was when we practiced because we were serious lifeguards. All of us were extremely good swimmers. We took series of tests. We had a lot of training, not just for the Red Cross training. We had serious training. And so all of us knew exactly what to do. And we expected everyone to be a part of the little tests you do, just to make sure everybody knew what to do if there was an emergency. So probably you know from your swimming experiences, the lifeguards do something, and that means everyone get out of the pool. So that was always fun because did you ever, when you were little, want to be the person who got to be saved? <laughs> so there was generally someone who couldn't wait to be saved. So they'd jump in and everybody would watch as we'd throw something to them and they'd get to flail around. and they'd have a lot of fun with that. So the only part of our rotation none of us liked was the baby pool. Yes, you got to sit in the shade, but it was really a baby pool, and you hoped that at least 70% of the water was water and not urine. And, <laughs> but it was easy, because that was where all the parents sat with their children. That was required. So I'm hanging out there one day, and I have parents on one side and a friend on the other, and I talk to my friend, but of course I never kept my eyes off the pool because that's what you did as a lifeguard. You watched everybody all the time. So everybody's playing, and all of a sudden, a little girl ran up to the woman next to me and said, I don't know what's wrong with Tom. So I was up. I was up immediately. I was scanning the face of every little person in that pool. And at one point, I realized that one little boy maybe wasn't playing. And this all happened so fast, like that. He had looked like he was doing what we did when we were young. You know, you're floating. And you let your mouth come up, and you get a breath. And you come back around, you get another breath, and you go under again. But I really looked at him, and his mouth was completely full of water, and it really was just like that idea that I'd heard people say that when someone's at least going unconscious, it's like a light, and their eyes is flickering and going out. And the light in his eyes was just about gone. So then I... It was like automatic pilot. Picked him up, 
took him to the side, lay him on his side, and immediately forgot all the training I had ever learned. I pressed gently, and all the water came out, and he started screaming, and I had all these people looking at me like, what do we do now? And I forgot the protocol. So I looked at my friend and said, go get Mary my best friend who was in the deep end in the big pool. And the next thing I hear is the whistle blowing everybody out of the pool. So I saved this little boy's life, but after that, I was nobody's friend. I didn't lose my job, but my hours were cut to half. I got to continue teaching swimming. And what I did after that was start asking everybody I knew, what do you think someone looks like when they're drowning? And everybody said, well, they're going to flail around. And, and then I started asking more and more people. And nine times out of 10, people said, I just froze. Or I saw someone, and they were just frozen. And the more I learned, the more I discovered that most people froze. So I was glad that I got to keep my job of at least teaching swimming, because I was still allowed to teach the life-saving classes. So you can guess what was the first thing I said to all the eager faces who wanted to become lifeguards. What do you think a drowning person looks like? Katie Redmond, everybody. Katie Redmond right there. Hi, come on in, folks. Here we go. We have a couple of storytellers left. Um, maybe they just read sign language and they're just standing out there. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. They're watching the stories and uh, yeah, it really is. Um, and these are really expensive to get in here. I mean, wow, we have two. There you go. And here we go. We are going to pull right here. Ray Engen is going to be our next storyteller right there. Ray Engen will be the next storyteller. Um, just so you guys know, at the end of the evening, uh, we're going to bring all the storytellers right back up top here so that you can see them once again and be reminded of their stories that way because sometimes it's hard to remember all the way back to the beginning of the evening. Uh, but we will bring them all up. Uh, there'll be one more after Ray. So ladies and gentlemen, let's bring him up to the stage right now. How about a huge round of applause for Ray Engen. In all honesty, I almost drowned twice growing up. And this is what I looked like when I almost drowned. <laughs> Ow. That's it though. That's what I look like. Are these like honed in here? Anyway. Come. Sit right back. I'm the guy that had the girl who was a SEAL trainer <laughs> as a girlfriend. And she used to bring injured SEALs home because she had a pool at home. And her favorite SEAL of all time was named Cobalt. <laughs> and what she did, she taught him to come in between me and her and just bop out of the water and go, ah, 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 ah. So that's what it really sounds like. Come, sit right back, and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port <laughs> aboard this tiny ship. Actually, I really wanted to talk about today. I've had the weirdest day today. I woke up today. Maybe you can stay in one place. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a water sign, yet I can't swim, hence the drowning twice. So I woke up today and realized I have no shampoo. <laughs> You'll get it soon. Because I wake up, I put shampoo in the beard, right? Then I went outside, and I went to go 
take the weeds and put the water on the lawn. And it didn't come in on the lawn. I turned it on, nothing came out. I turned it on, nothing came out. Turned it on, nothing came out. So I go, huh, oh, that's interesting. I must not have any water outside the house. So I walked inside, walked in the shower, turned it on, said, oh, <laughs> there's nothing coming out of here either. Because apparently these two things are separate in my own mind. <laughs> and so I have to like scrape shampoo with no water off my beard, which is why it's white. It's not normally that color, right? And I have to get out, get ready to go to work. And I open up my door. And I open the door, and on my door is a gang sign, which I didn't decorate in gang, by the way. And I look at the door, and I said, this is very interesting. I've never had this before, because I'm new to Petaluma. But I have a lot of gang experience, because I grew up in the mean streets of Marin. <laughs> you know, oh yeah, there's gangs of plenty down there, like the plaids and the pleats rumbling beyond the haberdashery, you know, it's like, hey, 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 home lads. <laughs> what is up with your bad selves? Huh. <laughs> I sense it's time to engage in a tour for, for as you know, location, location, location. So I have no shampoo. I have gang tattoos. Is it tattoos? Would it be tattoos? What do you call those that are on your door? Gang stuff on your door. I go to work, we lost the biggest client we've had all year. So I'm just on a roll, right? But then I get home, because I'm in sales, I get home, and I learn more about sales today from a 10-year-old kid than I've ever learned in my life. I get a phone call, and normally, the reason I was picking weeds, because I have a kid that does the lawn for me. His name's Steve Fainaroo. And he does a great job for me, but he's on vacation. And I get a call today from another kid. He says, hi, my name is Steve Lanotte. I just moved in the neighborhood. And I really want to do your lawn work. I'm trying to build a business here. Uh, I really want to do that for you. And I started thinking, well, you know, my buddy Steve, he does, he's been doing it for a little bit now. And I'm really faithful to him because I know one of his relatives from back in the Marin days, you know, and we're tight gang-wise and everything. And so, no, I'm fine. I'm fine with Steve. He goes, well, Mr. Ingen, I'll do a great job for you. And I go, well, Steve does a great job for me. He's done it a couple times. It's great. No problem. I'll do it for $5, Mr. Ingen. Now I'm thinking, OK, well, Steve does it for $10. <laughs> so I might be saving some money. Say, no, 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 no. He's done a great job. He's a great kid. I have no problem with Steve. Mr. Ingen, I'll do it for free. I'll do it for free for five times, then I'll charge you $5. Decision time. You know what? This kid, Steve Fainaroo, is doing a great job. Steve Lanotte, never heard of before. You know what? I'm going to stay with Steve. He's done a great job for me before. I'm not going away. I'm pretty loyal to this guy, Steve. At that moment, the little kid on the phone's voice changed. And what he said was, Thank you, Mr. Engen. This is actually Steve Fainer. I'm just trying to make sure I'm doing a good job for you. <laughs> so that's the best thing I learned today. Thank you. Sorry. Ray Engen, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Ray Engen. OK, I am, uh, I got a couple things I want to mention right here. Um, First thing, um, hopefully everything's all right out there. Uh, oh, don't, oh, we have one more storyteller. Everybody doesn't need to leave. Uh, and then um, one other thing. I actually have another commitment tonight, uh, crazily enough, and have to leave right after I introduce this next storyteller. So I literally, I have to go to my day job. Uh, it's night, but I have to go to the day job and have a mandatory meeting at uh, Whole Foods Market, which is where I work uh, 40 hours a week. So I'm going to introduce this next storyteller, and then I'm going to ask, uh, let's see, who will I ask to come up and close out this show? Uh, you'll do it? Okay, my wife Juliet will do it, and uh, she knows exactly how the whole thing uh, happens, and uh, you have the green tickets, I think, are right over there. So um, the next and final storyteller for this evening, uh, and it it is Cheryl Berry. Cheryl, are you back here? Yes, there you are. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage for the very first time, 
Cheryl, Barry. Yeah. Keep it coming until she gets here. Come on. So there I was, five feet from a seal. And we were just looking at each other. No. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Am I swimming with the alligators? Am I on the cruise ship? No. The water I can't drink is a glacier. I'm standing at the foot of a 600-foot glacier going straight up and I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. But my boyfriend is there, and he helps me strap on the crampons. And he shows me how to use an ice axe. It's a gnarly looking thing. It's like a T, but it's all metal and pointy with teeth. And what I have to do, ooh, it crinkles, is I stab it down in front of me, and then I take my two steps, and then I stab it down, and take my two steps. Now, if any of you have ever been at altitude, you know it's a lot of work for those two steps. Because there's less oxygen, and that activity is like a combination of the Nordic track and a Stairmaster, all with less oxygen. But I was going up that glacier. And one of the things I learned going up that glacier is going straight up was really not working for me. It was just too straight up. So I learned to go a little to the left and then tack back and go a little to the right because it was easier when you're having to count your steps because your chest is just aching and your lungs are ready to burst out of it because you just want some oxygen. That's what you do. The water that you can't drink is the rock. I don't want to sit down to rest my legs because I'd sit in the snow and my pants would get wet and I didn't want that. So I'm sitting on a rock just to rest. The one rock is just a sea of white, but I get to sit on one rock. And I'm working harder as I'm climbing than I've ever worked in my life. I am sweating. It's cold, it's windy. I am sweating on this glacier. More water I couldn't drink. I'm continuing to zig and zag my way up this vertical slope. My climbing partner is waiting for me. And I am so hungry after climbing. Cheez-Its have never tasted so good. We scrambled over the rocks to the next part of the glacier, and I look down, and I see some elk vertebrae bleached on the rocks. I reach down to pick one up, thinking, what an incredible souvenir. I can take this back from the glacier. And then I thought, I'll have to carry it. That's extra weight. Maybe not. So as I continued up the glacier, it was a very sheer slope. And I looked down. It was a long way down. But I was not afraid. I was very curious, me who has a fear of heights. I was not afraid looking down how far it was. And I continued up that glacier, the 600 sheer vertical feet to the very top. And I stood on the top of the world, 12,000 feet. You could see for miles all around. And I looked back down and I thought, I didn't know what it would take to climb this glacier. Sometimes it's not a direct route. Sometimes it's OK to zig and zag if you need to. And to keep taking every step, even if you have to count each step before you stop, 
you keep going because you know you want to get to the top. So each of you on your life's climb, whether it's through water or up a glacier, know that you can take your meandering way, but just keep stepping. That's Cheryl Berry. Okay, so I'm Dave right now. So uh, can I have the 10 people who told their stories come up here and come sit out here? And this is uh, your opportunity, if you're sitting in the audience, to take your green ticket out. Oh, I have the wrong basket, hold on. First of all, let's give everybody a round of applause for such good stories tonight. Don't forget, next month is August 10th and it's uh, high school. Okay, we all have our tickets out now. Here we go. Remember, this is, who, who moved you the most? Like, like Dave said, it's not the best story, but it's the story that maybe affected you the most. Here's the number. Don't have my glasses, of course. 646-4607. Okay. Tell us what you think. Uh, Leslie. Leslie. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie Skatcher. <laughs> Thank you all again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, storytellers. Please tell your friends. Sign up for uh, Facebook. That's been tonight. Thank you all. Modesto, California.